And I wanted people to see how great they were, how great the act were, how they were to each other and how much, you know, they loved their kids. And so everything I did was about trying to get them together. So I go to the manager at that time and I said, look, you're not going to find anyone who loves Steve Lawrence and Edie Gourmet more than me. What is it going to take to do a TV show with them? And the manager said, well, you know, I mean, what are you calling from a TV station in New Jersey? I mean, uh, that doesn't count. Uh, yeah. So I'm like, that doesn't count. OK. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, if you get someone like Dwight Hemian involved, she said, well, then I'll take it to Steve. OK. Who's Dwight Hemian? I have no idea. Turns out he's a, a great producer director who had been around for many years, but he he died 20 years before I was born. And she knew that. Right. So she wow. sent me on this wild goose chase to find this guy, the key to getting Steve and Edie on a show. And and the guy was long gone, <laughs> long dust, dust. And, and I was never going to find him. And then I would go back the next year and I would kiss the ring and I'd say, please, I just want to do a show with Steve and Edie, please, please, please. And she'd give me some other dead guy to find. And and this went on for 20 years. <laughs> you call it a dream the deferred. <laughs> to the ends of the earth, I went to find these challenges that she put up. And, and she was just playing games. She knew that she was never going to tell Steve that I wanted to do this or there was an offer or any of that stuff. So finally, now this is, this is not going to sound nice, but... After about 22 years of doing this, she died. So that's when I said, uh-huh. Oh, this is like the scene, you know, Joan Collins and Betty Davis. You know, she died. So, <laughs> so that means there may be some good things that come from this. <laughs> and I was able to call the son. And uh, the son wasn't, I, I think, enamored by this manager because he kept the act away from big uh, things like the Hollywood Bowl Wow. and doing major major stuff so we both shared this like hey she's dead let's do something <laughs> so wow. the doors opened up it's like heavens and heavens and earth it just opened up and they said yes you can do what you want to do with steve lawrence and Edie gourmet and so that was an amazing thing but it it took her sadly leaving the mortal coil to me it sounds like a, a broadway musical you've got these two beautiful young gifted people who meet on the Steve Allen's Tonight Show. What an adventure that must have been for the two of them. Doing live TV, singing live, falling in love, starting a family, and then all of this music. It For me, it's like every now and then I'll check Amazon to see if there's a Steve and Edie biography because I, I can't know enough about them. That's how interested I am. And she kept that from from happening oh, she's man. the one who stopped that from ever i'm not the first guy who said hey let's do something on steve and edie she would just shoot it down at every point but suddenly once i met david mm -hmm. i said look i love your mom and dad you love your mom and dad sit down with me in front of a camera and just relate what you remember about each one of these songs and growing up in this michigas household that you're from because <laughs> it's very much like the borscht belt when you're uh, you know, growing up with with uh, Steve, who's an Ashkenazi Jew, Edie was Sephardic. And so it was always like, says this nice Jewish boy from, you know, New Jersey. It was it was very much like holding court every day and in his house. Mel Brooks would show up or Peter Sellers would show up. All these amazing people that we take for granted was just part of their lives. Mm -hmm. And so it's really, to me, a Jewish story in a sense, because it's about these beautiful young people, they meet, they fall in love, they keep their separate identities, except for on special occasions where they do perform together. They start a family. Their youngest son was, I think, 21 years old when he died from like a sudden death syndrome, something related to his heart. And that nearly, you know, destroyed them all. Meanwhile, David is still trying to go and still trying to, you know, keep everything moving with his parents. And then his dad gets Alzheimer's. Bad shape, end stage Alzheimer's. Edie uh, died 10 years ago. So Carol Burnett comes in as kind of a surrogate mother to David mm. after his mom had passed away. You go through things sometimes in life and, and with this great determination, uh, hoping that you're creating some healing, healing energy and, and healing for the people involved. That's kind of my intent. Uh, the mm -hmm. other stuff that comes along, if you're on the right track, is all good stuff that follows. But going mm -hmm. into it, it's trying to give something that really creates a closure for, for the performers and also for the audience. Uh, it wasn't about giving uh, Steve some help or closure with, with Edie's passing. It wasn't about making sure the world knows about Edie Gourmet. 
I really believe it was about giving David some closure. So it all goes back to intent. with me. Sometimes you don't understand the why until after you've done the work. And that, that's fascinating. And we all have to be open to that, that we're, never, we're not always going to get what we want when we want it. But when we get it, it will make sense as to why we needed to wait. 